I'd like to tell a story, which I tell occasionally. I was told once that um, in the mid-1960s, there were three high school girls who lived someplace down here, like in Mountain View, in uh, Menlo Park. And um, Menlo Park, those of you who've been around long enough, near the corner of Alameda and Sand Hill, was one of the local centers for the burgeoning LSD culture. The Grateful Dead were stationed there, and uh, Ken Kesey was down there, and the Electric Cool Age acid bus started from there. It's very important for the history of the times. And um, so it was a period of, you know, a lot of LSD. And these uh, girls uh, learned that there was a Zen teacher in San Francisco who could teach them how to get high naturally. So they went up there to see uh, Shinryu Suzuki, Suzuki Roshi, and then in the old uh, Japanese temple, Soto Zen, Zen temple in Japantown. And um, he welcomed them in, and they asked them the question, you know, how do you get high naturally? And he proceeded to give them a talk on the Four Noble Truths. <laughs> suffering. <laughs> the cause of suffering. The cessation of suffering. The Noble Eightfold Path to the cessation of suffering. This is not what these girls were expecting or wanting, except that the man who was teaching them these truths about suffering, he was so happy. And at least for one of those young women, um, his happiness was so contagious or so meaningful that uh, she's been a Buddhist practitioner ever since. Became a Zen student and so, um, so this uh, juxtaposition of the focus on suffering and happiness. In a sense, they go together, in the sense that the Four Noble Truths are meant to help us address suffering in such a way we come out to the other side into happiness, into well-being, into peace. The, um, so, uh, I was thinking about this this morning, and a little bit like... Um, the Buddhists who really understand the Four Noble Truths and their value become a little bit like firefighters where they go towards the fire. Everyone else might go away. So this willingness to look at suffering, to study it, to stop for it, to really take it in, not to suffer better, but rather to really uh, address it deeply. And not a few people have been quite moved by their encounter with Buddhism because um, uh, some people say this explicitly that it's the first time in their lives that they met some teaching that addressed the issue of suffering in human life. Whereas everywhere else they'd been in their life up to that point, people seem to avoid it, distract themselves from it, uh, run away from it. And, um, you know, it's a tender and important and profound issue of the human condition that we have suffering of all kinds of different types and uh, from the most mild to some of the most biggest uh, possible things we can experience. So it's a tender thing, it's a delicate thing to talk about because it touches something that's very primal to many of us. But this is what the purposes of the Four Noble Truths is to address it, to understand it. And what I want to talk about today is not uh, the whole Four Noble Truths, but rather the second noble truth. The second noble truth uh, is most popularly understood as being the cause of suffering. Whereas, uh, in fact, uh, the ancient text teaching the Buddha, he doesn't say that, but it's, uh, but it's often interpreted that way. But rather, there are four different interpretations for what the second noble truth is. Most literally, uh, the wording of it says, it's the noble truth of the arising of suffering. 
So there's four interpretations of what this might mean. And to, to hear these four is a little bit of a journey. I like to think of it as a journey. And uh, they're available, you know, to understand these different interpretations and different perspectives, different <coughs> angles with which to understand our suffering and what underlies them or how to get deeper into it in a meaningful way. But they can also uh, be a journey of getting more settled where the mindfulness gets stronger, the, our being, our mind, our hearts get more and more settled and peaceful. And as we get more concentrated and still, and the mindfulness gets stronger, we start seeing in new ways. We become more sensitive to bigger pieces of the picture of what's happening. And, um, and so more information is available to us. And as that more information about suffering becomes available, we can start having a different relationship to it or that information can have a, a different effect on us. And the effect that in Buddhism we're looking for is liberation, liberation from suffering, the cessation of suffering. So the first interpretation, and the one that's, I think, probably most commonly taught, is the idea that our suffering is caused by a certain kind of insistent desire insistent desire that is uh, usually uh, translated into English by the word craving. So a certain kind of compulsion, a certain kind of uh, energetic desire, even desire for useful and appropriate things can be a little bit too insistent, a little bit too much, have, have, us, by their th it's by, have us by our throat, you know, you've got to do this. There can be a lot of expectation involved in them, a lot of need associated with them. And, uh, uh, you know, um, and so this sense of uh, insistence that can come with desire can be a source of tremendous suffering. We're holding on to something. We want something so desperately. And uh, in ordinary life, sometimes this can be seen relatively easily in different circumstances that we want, want something, but we can't have it. The conditions have changed or, or such that we can't have it. And we realize that if I keep wanting this, I'm just going to keep being disappointed or keep being frustrated, so I'll drop it. And, um, you know, it could be that your internet doesn't work. You know, you, that's a, you know for some people that's a s serious thing. And um, so you can feel the desire, that all the desires that come along with being on your device and on your computer. And at some point, the power outage doesn't get fixed for a while. And at some point, um, you know, you realize that this desire, I, I better let go of it for now. I better not hold on to it because if I kind of pace my house, keep trying the, road, the modem over and over again, uh, try to shake the computer upside down, see to make it work over and over again, you know, that, that frustration, that insistence, that, you know, desperation is not going to be for my betterment. And so at some point it's put down and realize, okay, I can't, nothing I can do here so that I'll, you know, I want, I certainly want the, the the internet to come back on, but I can't do anything. I'll just have to wait. So, you know, I guess, you you know, a few people would just sit quietly and meditate and go out and work in their garden or sit and you know, have a cup of tea or do something nice. Some people would rush out, of course, to the coffee shop, the library, anywhere where it might be. But, uh, <clears throat> you know, there's a, you probably have your own examples of seeing you have some insistent desire, something you want, something you can't have. And so you don't necessarily deny that you have the desire, but you, to drop, you drop having it, being active. Um, because if you keep having it up to active, the frustration is going to be there, the uh, expectation is going to be there. So to see the cause, and uh, some things are relatively easy, and some things are quite difficult to see the underlying cause for them. And that's why uh, something like meditation can settle the mind enough that uh, sometimes we can see more deeply than the surface of chatter of the mind. And we can see some of the deeper causes for, for, of our suffering. And um, it might be that uh, what we really want, the real cause, is a clinging or a desire to be seen, to be respected, to have certain status. Within reason, that could be appropriate, but that can be overdone. 
but to see how that underlying drive for identity, underlying drive for, you know, to be seen, how it operates might be hard because it manifests itself in a desire for, you know, something else, a desire for, um, it could be the desire for wearing a nice set of clothes. You know, I better wear the right clothes and all my clothes are dirty or I don't have nice clothes and I better find nice clothes. And you sit and be quiet and you notice that the desire, the drive for clothes is really an expression of a deeper desire. And so we start seeing some, as we sit quietly, we sometimes start seeing these deeper, what's called causes, the desires that are behind it. Sometimes it's quite hard to find the cause and even if we do find the underlying cause, some of these things that drive us and motivate us are hard just to drop and put down. There sometimes, you know, there's such almost primal urges that arise within us that um, even if someone points it out or we see it clearly, how do we drop it? How do we stop being this way? And so it's, it's difficult. So if we practice something like meditation and are able to get quieter and stiller, uh, one of the things that happens is the mindfulness, the awareness can open up to, to see a greater piece of the mental ecology, of the things that are going on. And we start seeing uh, uh, not just the immediate cause or what we would call the cause, we see, you see the range of conditions uh, that have to come into play for the suffering to be there. And this is the second interpretation of the Four Noble Truths, or the Second Noble Truth, and that is that the second, the, 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 um, it's the truth of the conditions that bring about the suffering. Now the value about the conditions is that uh, it's, a, it's a bigger range of things to study and be aware of. And some of those conditions you might have more control over than the cause itself. So, I mean, I'll give you a little bit of an of a analogy. Um, we have in the, here this conference room, this little room on the side here. Um, we have a little uh, space heater that we plug into electrical outlet when we want to use it. And uh, every once in a while, someone will, when it's cold, someone will plug it in and have it run. And they'll forget to unplug it or to turn it off. And we'll come back and come in the next day and the room is like a sauna. So that's not very good. So, uh, you know, what to do? We could be upset with all the people who use it. We could uh, send out emails and say, you know, remember, if anybody uses it, please remember to, to unplug it. And then we do that, and then it happens some months later, it happens again, and so then we can get frustrated. We really want this to be unplugged, you know, unplugged and not be running overnight. And so, you know, we put up big signs, you know, we could do all kinds of things. But it, still, people are, you know. So th the cause, in a sense, of that the heater being on is those people who don't unplug it after using it. So we can be upset about the people. The other option is, which we finally figured out, is now we have a little device that plugs into the outlet that has a timer on it. And now we plug the electrical cord from the space heater into that outlet in order to have the electricity go to the space heater, you have to choose one hour, two hour, three hour. <laughs> and, uh, and now if someone forgets, it'll go off automatically. So the electricity and the outlet is just a condition for having the heater work. It's not the cause for it being left on, but it's part of the conditions that are needed. So we address the underlying condition rather than what we would call the cause. So the same thing with our suffering. Sometimes if we, if we understand the, the more of the pieces of what's uh, uh, involved, we can start identifying the conditions of our suffering that might not be called a cause. And uh, one of the conditions, some, I mean all kinds of things can be a condition, but one example would be that if a person has, is really uh, challenged by something, by strong desire, maybe addictive desire, and, um, and see, it, let's say, say it's alcohol, and seeing, uh, you know, the, the, if there's a bottle of 
alcohol on the table, that bottle is not the cause of going to get a drink. The person going for the drink would be considered the causes in themselves. But the, the bottle there is a condition, and seeing it is a condition for drinking. If the bottle is not on the table, or if the bottle is not even at home, then uh, the, chance, the chances of the addiction the desire rearing up so strongly is not going to be there. So sometimes we can take care, we can do something about the condition and not the cause. A strong desire for, um, you know, for you know, some people I know have an addic- not addiction, but they have a, a, a weakness for donuts. <laughs> and then they feel bad about themselves afterwards because they've you know, succumbed to the donut thing. So, um, so don't go to that coffee shop <laughs> where they sell donuts. Go to the coffee shop that doesn't sell any sweets. So because that's a condition, right? So you could say, well, you should, you know, grow up maybe and deal with your strong desire and uh, and just kind of overcome the cause of it, your desire, and get on with it. But that's kind of unrealistic sometimes, uh, you know, in, in human lives. So what's the underlying conditions? One of the underlying conditions that Buddhism uh, emphasizes is something called ignorance. And this is uh, kind of a misunderstanding about things. So for example, there can be a misunderstanding of uh, what brings happiness. Uh, We might think that um, pleasure brings happiness. And so we pursue pleasure, and certainly there's good feelings that come with pleasure, but it's not really a heartfelt happiness there. And so, um, and so the confusion, the ignorance about what, ha- what brings happiness can lead people to pursue the wrong kind of, the, r- the wrong pursuit. Pursuit that sometimes lends itself to further suffering. So to uh, be ignorant, to have this ignorance about what happiness, the difference between happiness and pleasure, it can be one of the conditions. And if that condition changes, then we're not gonna pursue pleasure in inappropriate ways perhaps. It might be that um, the underlying condition might be um, a, fe- a belief that, you know, it might, might be that the desire is to be in a certain kind of intimate relationship with someone. And there's a strong, insistent desire and need to be in the relationship or to hold on to that relationship. If we start looking deeper for the conditions for that insistence, there are some people for whom it's a, a, a strong uh, desire for security, to feel safe in this world. And being in that relationship creates a certain kind of safety. But then the question is, uh, is that the best place, best way to be safe? If that's really the need, is there another way to be safe that doesn't depend on another person providing it? And so there's this maybe a kind of ignorance about what's, where safety resides. There can be um, uh, ignorance about <clears throat> uh, the permanence of things. People can believe that certain things are going to be here all the time, and then when they go away, there's a lot of suffering. But when we have a sense, you know, that everything changes. Everything comes and goes, and it's sad that certain things go and people die for sure. But it's not an, an insult. It's not a betray. Reality hasn't betrayed us because we have a flat tire. Reality doesn't, hasn't betrayed us because we get sick and maybe die. It's kind of built into the human condition to some degree to have things come and go, appear, disappear, be born and then die. And how we live in the world of birth and death is a tender and delicate thing. But, you know, it's not a... It's not you know, shouldn't be unexpected. You know, we shouldn't be holding on. It has to be this way forever. And so that's a condition that goes into all this. And so as we sit and get deeper into ourselves and get settled enough, we can start seeing some of the different thoughts and ideas and feelings and impulses that are holding this whole kind of desire thing in place. And we start seeing some of the underlying conditions that go on. 
And some of those conditions then can be shifted and changed better than some, sometimes the drive for the desire. But then the desire changes too once the conditions, underlying conditions have changed. So we go further. Um, as we get more settled and more still and more aware, there's a greater sensitivity, kind of a physical, visceral sensitivity to what's happening here. And one of the, one of the interpreta- third interpretations of the second noble truth, the, the truth of the arising of suffering, is that suffering, uh, a strong desire, insistent desire, craving, is suffering. It's not the, it, it can be the cause of suffering, can be a condition for suffering, but in and of itself, to have this craving, this um, clawing, needing, this, this, this uh, clinging, this uh, obsession with the desire, that in itself can feel tense, it can come with uh, uh, contraction, it can come with a kind of fever sometimes, a kind of pushing and demanding, a kind of feeling that we're not under control, uh, control of our own life. It can come with, uh, it, can, it can feel the, the, the tension, the irritation, the, how in and of itself craving is uncomfortable. So, uh, so rather than needing to kind of convince ourselves that what we want is not the right thing, or that uh, we want, to, or the, you know, having this desire is not useful, uh, we have a visceral feeling that having the desire in this kind of way is not healthy. And some people will only give up certain desires when they feel that that strong, insistent desiring feels so uncomfortable to have. Why would I do this to myself? The stiller and quieter the mind is in meditation, the more ease and peace we have in meditation, the less um, willingness or tolerance we have, to me tolerance is the wrong word, but willingness, less interest, to allow ourselves to continue to feel the discomfort of having insistent desire. If you're basically uncomfortable already, (laughs) and you're running around being busy in your life, what is a little bit more discomfort? <laughs> you know, you, you don't even notice it. You know, the, the discomfort or desire is kind of subtle, some of it, and you have much better, you know, you have bigger things to be uncomfortable about, and so you, you, don't, you, don't, you, you, you hardly notice. That's one of the advantages of something like meditation, so that we can start feeling the discomforts in our lives that we usually don't notice, usually ignore. So we don't make this the big advertisement for meditation, come and be uncomfortable. You know, this is where you can really do discomfort well. So don't let the secret out, but that's, you know. <laughs> but to some degree, that's one of the functions of meditation, mindfulness, is to is, uh, get concentrated and still enough to really see the impact of, uh, on ourselves of how the mind operates and how, see the, feel the impact of these desires. And it's better to be... Um, to know you're uncomfortable than to not know it. Because if you know it, then you can do something about it. And if the, and if it's this, if, you know, and, and you might not even know what the desire is for. You don't have to know what it's for. All you have to know is it's uncomfortable and I'll let go of it. I'll settle down. Um, and I've had that uh, in meditation outside. I, I've, I'm qu- apparently quite capable of having this urge, like a, for, to want to desire something. <laughs> I, I don't know what yet, but I'll, uh, <laughs> I'll figure that out later. <laughs> so, so this idea of just, fe- just feeling what that urge is like, um, you know, and to realize that to crave, to have insistent desire itself is uncomfortable, is a kind of suffering. That's a third level of these, uh, the second noble truth. The fourth level, and this is uh, most closely associated with meditation. It doesn't have to be any of these, but this is the most, and that is to be, uh, learn how to find a way in meditation to become, uh, mindfulness becomes quite strong. 
the whole, our whole system has gotten quite still and peaceful. And in, this, in, a, in, a, in a situation where we're concentrated and still and mindful, there's a way in which there's kind of this, uh, this reversal. The more still we can become, the more we tune in to how things are constantly changing. The more we're agitated and spinning in our thoughts, the more we have this illusion that things are much more still and permanent and solid than they actually are. So as we get stiller and stiller and stiller, then we start seeing that, uh, that in the, we're more and more in the present moment. We're more in the flow of the experiences happening now. We're not thinking about the past and thinking about the future. We're not rehearsing the same thing over and over and over again, which gives a semblance of permanence because we keep repeating the same ideas. The thinking mind has gotten quiet. And then we start, whatever is going on in the present moment is, feels more like a flow, more like an unfolding. It's more uh, the arising and passing, the appearance of disappearings of things. So we have a thought, and we're where the thought arises. Uh, and it, the appearance of a thought is more significant than what we're thinking. Often we're concerned by what we're thinking. But the fact, oh, there's a thought. I have better things to do than to think. I was sitting here peacefully minding my own business. Why would I now get involved in this thought? And so, and then it passes away. We pa- passes or we let go of it. Uh, we start seeing that the body sensations we have are actually kind of a dance, a kaleidoscope dance of sensations appearing and disappearing. What seemed like a solid sensation turns out to be, you know, pixels of sensations that come and go. The emotions that we thought that were so solid, you know, we were just in this mood. The mood hasn't gone away exactly, but the mood itself is comes and goes in and out of in and out of perception. Uh, we're aware of it, we're not aware of it, we're aware of something else. And there's this constant shifting, changing panorama of what we're aware of, what's happening in the moment. Uh, some things arise and pass, sometimes the perception shifts and takes in something else for a moment. There's this kind of wonderful kind of kind of flow that people have. And, um, and what people start seeing more and more acutely is th- what's called the arising and ceasing of things. So as I said, <clears throat> the traditional wording, the literal wording of the second noble truth, the way it's described, it's the, uh, the noble truth of the arising of suffering. The third noble truth is a noble truth of the ceasing, the cessation of suffering. So at times we start seeing things arise and pass and rise and pass. And this, is a very di- and this also is a very different way of relating to suffering. Our suffering is still there, but we see that it's not constant. There's gaps in it. It's kind of part of this dance and flow of things. And so the mind's at, the mind has a way of attributing permanence to our suffering. We kind of hold it in a package, or this, this is fixed, it's stuck, it's heavy, it's, it's solid, I'm here with my suffering, this is what it is. And it can be so dense and so impenetrable that it's hard to have a different relationship to it. We're kind of like stuck in it. But if, we can, if we're quiet enough and still enough with the mindfulness, and start seeing that whatever this thing is that we're calling suffering is made up of phenomena that's arising and passing and coming and going. It's not solid. It's actually not so stuck. And it's just, a fun, it's just like everything else, it's phenomena that comes and goes. Then the grip, the holding, the clinging, the insistence we have on those desires begin to lighten up. Our identification with the desire begins to lighten up our kind of being glued to it becomes unglued. We become a little bit step back. We're not, we're, we may have more of the sense of the panoramic view of it maybe than being kind of stuck in the middle of it. And there's a way in which uh, seeing the arising and passing of phenomena is considered one of the, in and of itself, begins to help the mind release the fist of clinging, the way in which we hold on to things or push on things. And it doesn't require understanding the cause. It doesn't have to require understanding the condition. 
It doesn't have doesn't require seeing that uh, craving is itself suffering. It's just that just seeing how things arise and pass shows us a whole different paradigm for what's happening in the moment and how it doesn't make any sense to cling. It doesn't actually work to cling in this experience. That um, it's not worth clinging to things that are coming and going all the time. In, in this moment-to-moment experience. Now, if you pull yourself out of this quiet place and start debating with yourself, well, some things are really worth clinging to. You can have a wonderful debate with yourself and come up with great things to cling to. However, you've left that quiet world where things are coming and going and rising and passing. Things are peaceful. And so you don't have access to the kind of peace and the letting go that that arising and passing can, can give. And so then, of course, then this, this experience of inconstancy can't help us because we're not in touch with it. If we go back up into the conceptual world of talk, thinking about how, what's, what's true and what's coming and all that. So, four interpretations of the second noble truth. In different circumstances of our life, different ones of them are relevant and useful. Uh, different circumstances, different ones of them are accessible to us. Sometimes it's the cause. It's helpful to see the cause. And exploring and considering the cause is really good. However, some people are so... That's the only approach they have. And sometimes only kind of reviewing and thinking and analyzing, looking for the cause, can be a dead end. It's not some people... It's not doesn't open up for people what's going on. So it's useful, but sometimes it's not. Sometimes what's accessible and useful is to look at the conditions. What are all the conditions in place for this, for me to want this? Sometimes those conditions have to do with things that happen in childhood, uh, and, you know, big influences in us. That uh, once we understand those early childhood conditions, then we understand the, uh, why we have a certain drives, why we have the, the cause of certain desires we have today. So the conditions is an interesting world. And sometimes it's quite simple. Uh, you know, it's, uh, we, we see, we have a certain belief that once, once we see the underlying belief, we see well, that belief doesn't work. But the belief is the condition for the desire. The third is sometimes it's just so obvious how uncomfortable I am having this desire. I don't care about the cause. I don't care about, you know, the conditions for it. Just, you know, Let's drop it. <laughs> it's not worth it. I'm feeling so uncomfortable. And then um, the fourth interpretation, the fourth approach to this is, um, has to do with seeing how things come and go, the impermanent and constant nature. Oh, here comes a desire. Here comes a suffering. I will guess I'll just ride the wave. I know that you know, some waves are short, some waves are big. And if I just ride the wave of discomfort, you know, I'm not going to make it worse. But uh, if you don't just simply, oh, here it is, I'm going to ride the discomfort, to ride the wave, uh, but rather I'm going to fight it, I'm going to hold on to it, I'm going to engage in it, I'm going to analyze it, I'm going to look for the cause. Sometimes looking for the cause is the cause. <laughs> <laughs> or the, looking for the cause kind of perpetuates something, the identification or something. But sometimes it's wise to see, oh, here it comes. I'll just ride the wave. And if you're lucky, it's a short wave. The, um, and if, it's, um, and if, you're, if you get invested in it or get identified with it, then it's usually a longer wave. So four different approaches to these Four Noble Truths, each of them in their own time and place. And I think it shows you, hopefully, the richness that this kind of teaching that the Buddha has, uh, has for us as we apply it. And also... Uh, I, uh, one of the things, one of the points I wanted to get across, is that we do have different states of mind that we live in, or different kind of, and so the approach, the understanding of our life varies at different states of mind, and if we only have one state of mind that we always live in, 
uh, we only have access to certain approaches then. And part of the function of meditation is to help us go into, you know, different states of mind. But, you know, not necessarily altered states in some dramatic way, so you don't have to get frightened about that. But states of mind where you're, you're peaceful or quiet or still, uh, so that you can be more sensitive and see in a different way. So. And then when some high school students come to you and ask you how to be happy without, na- naturally, you'll just light up <laughs> someday and sit, give them, talk to them about the Four Noble Truths. And maybe you'll inspire them. <laughs> 